church, put your hands together. Jesus, there is nothing like your presence. I will sing of all your goodness. Where all my fears fade to praise. Come on, church. There is nothing like your freedom Dancing with the hope of heaven Where all my fears go to praise And all I want more of you and less of me And all I want living in your victory And all I want let your glory fill this place Like your freedom, dancing with the hope of heaven. Oh, my fears fade to praise. Come on, make this your prayer. All I want, more of you and less of me. All I want, living in your victory. All I want, let your glory fill this place. Church, we found life in Jesus Christ. Amen. See you at lunch.
Good morning and welcome, Freedom Church. We're glad that you've joined us online this morning and tuned in. If you haven't already, invite someone via text or house party or whatever to get them to church. And we're so excited because this might possibly be our last Sunday of Freedom in the Field. So if you missed it, it's okay because next week, the first Sunday of July, we are going to be back in the house. Woo! So we're so excited for that. Please stay tuned online. Ben is going to have more announcements and more info on that. But right now, wherever you are, please, will you stand on your feet to give the one true God glory and honor and praise and worship this morning. Let's just cry out to Jesus, cry out to our God who is so faithful, who loves us endlessly, who is always with us and who deserves all of our praise today. Are you ready?
Death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you. He tried, but he lost. You cannot be stopped. When we cried for freedom, you tore down the walls. The weight of our burdens, you carried it all. Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. You cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus is trying. your victory and shout out your praise Come on, church. miracle maker you're mighty to save you're awesome in power relentless in love you can not be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus is triumph over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won. Nothing can stand against our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There is nothing that can stop our God. of the shore I trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first 
Beyond the barren place, beyond the ocean waves. When I walk through the waters, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way, so I am not afraid. You keep the promises you make. There isn't one that is delayed So I will not lose heart Here I will lift my arms And start to sing into the night My praise will call the sun to rise Declare the battle won Declare that it is done Declaring victory, my God will make a way, so I am not afraid. Before me, behind me, always beside me, no shadow, no valley. Will you won't find me? I am not afraid, oh no. You'll be You'll be for me, you'll be behind me, always beside me, no shadow, no valley, where you won't find me, I am not afraid, cause you'll be for me, behind me, always beside me. No valley where you won't find me. I am not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Thank you, Jesus.
You are here, you're working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are. My God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship. Turning lives around, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. Yeah. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper. Darkness, my God, that is. 
is who you It's not about our goodness. It's not about how good or how bad we've been or how good or bad we are. It's about the worst that you see in us. You see value in each and every one of us. Each and every life on this earth. gender, you don't see color, you don't see race, you see your son, Jesus Christ, when you look at us, you don't see our stature in this earthly realm, you don't see our faults and our failures, you see your son in us. Shout out the name of Jesus this morning. We have freedom in the name of Jesus. We have freedom in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, good morning, Freedom family and friends. We are so glad that you decided to join us this morning, wherever you're tuning in. If you're on LCTV, if you've tuned in on Facebook or at Church Online, thank you for being a part of this service and inviting us into your home. We are so glad that technology has allowed us to, during this time to be able to reach you and bring this message to you wherever you're at. And if you're tuning in for the first time or maybe you've been tuning in for several weeks now, what I'd ask you to do is just take a moment to fill out the connection card at the link on the screen. 
Um, and just to be able to connect with us so we can connect with you and get to know you a little bit. And also, um, if, if you've been tuning in, that's a place where you can submit prayer requests as well so that we can be praying for you because even though we aren't together right now, we love you and we care about you, and so we want to be able to do that. So if you want to, just take a moment to be able to do that, um, and, and we'll connect with you that way. Well, I just have a couple quick announcements for us this morning, and the first one is that our Freedom in the Field services are going to be extended due to some of the new requirements that have been released by our government locally and in our state. We can only have 33% capacity in our sanctuary at this time, that's what they've allowed us in phase four, which starts Tuesday. And so next week was going to be the week that we were all going to flood this building back up, but we're going to wait a little bit longer on that. We're going to continue with Freedom in the Field, uh, which really has been a great time. Tons of fun. We've had different things. We had a food truck a few weeks ago. And throughout this month of July, we're going to be doing different things um, after service. We'll have popsicles and we'll have uh, Coca-Cola. We're going to try to get another food truck and some other uh, cool things like that. So we'll be able to fellowship together afterward. But if you were here last week in the field, you experienced 90 degree weather with sun and no clouds. And some may say it was beautiful. Others may say it was way too hot. And so we understand that when it gets that hot, it actually becomes a health concern. And so we don't want to ever um, be, be limiting people based on the weather. Um, and so what we're going to do is, because we can have 33% capacity, we are going to do somewhat of a hybrid type of thing. We're still going to do Freeman in the Field out back, but we're also going to open up the sanctuary on Sunday mornings for up to 100 people to come in and watch the service live on the big screen. And so... That's got to be done uh, for those who really need it, for those who might have health issues, or those who maybe feel more comfortable being in the sanctuary. And so what we're going to do, because we can only have 100 people in here, we're going to ask that you register ahead of time. And so there's going to be a link on the page here where you're, you're going to be able to register for that if you want to be a part of that. Um, but this will be a great option for anybody who wants to come to church and kind of fellowship together, but not necessarily sit in the field. Um, and the nice thing about that is through the month of July, we're going to have those special events after each service, which if you're sitting in here, you'll be able to be a part of as well. Um, and I would also mention that for those services, bathrooms will not be available until the end of the service. And so when you come, we are keeping it to an hour. So it'll be 10 a.m. to 11. And then the bathrooms will open at 11. And we'll have some different things for fellowship together at that point. And so please, uh, if you haven't come to Freedom in the Field yet, come to that. Or register to come and, and watch the service together in this building here um, in the sanctuary. So that's exciting. And uh, it's another step forward. And so we're so excited about that. The other announcement I have uh, coming up, we have Motion starting up again at the end of July. And Motion is a way for all of us to get on the same page and to grow together to serve the body of Christ to see the kingdom come. That's what Jesus told us to do. He taught us how to pray that way and everything else. And so Motion is a four step, three week program. Uh, you sign up, you come here for an hour, you, you watch a video, you talk a little bit, you learn what your spiritual giftings are, you find out how God wired you, how he created you, and then you have the opportunity to be able to jump onto a team and begin to serve in a way that not only gives life to the church, but it gives life to you. And so um, I'm going to ask that you would sign up for that. If you haven't yet, please be a part of it. We would love for everybody to experience motion and to join the Go Team. Back in March before all this happened, we had a big Go Team party. It was 80s theme, and it was tons of fun. And that's just our way of thanking everyone that's a part of that team. And so you can be a part of that team as well by signing up for motion. And so please take a moment to do that. Um, at some point today. That's going to be on Wednesday nights, by the way. And so that'll coincide with Nexus. It'll be great. There'll be child care for younger kids. And so it should be nice and easy for you uh, this time around to be able to be a part of that. And so with that being said, I do just want to let you know how you can give this morning. Thank you again, church, for your faithfulness. Uh, you have blown us away, and we are so thankful for each and every one of you. And so if you want to continue to give in this time, you can do that uh, via the Church Center app. 
You can click the giving link or you can bring in your tithe or mail it into the church here, uh, 5676 Beatty Avenue in Lockport, and we would uh, receive it that way. So thank you again. God bless you. Grab a notepad or notebook or your sermon notes and get ready for the message this morning. Well, hey there, everybody. It is good to be with you today. Thank you so much for just inviting us into your life this morning. My name is Pastor Craig Campbell, and I have the privilege of pastoring at Freedom Church in in Lockport, New York. And this is a place where we want to see people that don't know Jesus be introduced to who he really is. Not only that, for those who do know Jesus to grow in his grace and have a greater love for him as well as learn of him. But for all of us, our desire really is to walk in the freedom that only Jesus Christ provides. Today, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. We're going to go into a new series that we're calling Jubilee. And we're really excited about this series over the summertime here. We're going to get in some background of what what, what God says from, the, from his word today and, and what this whole idea of a jubilee is all about. But as I was preparing this, this series and this message today, uh, my, my plans changed just a little bit. Things shifted up on me a little bit. I believe God wanted me to share a bit more of what behind the scenes looks like before we get into all that God wanted to actually accomplish through his idea of jubilee for the Jewish people. And, and not only for the Jewish people, but what that means for us today. What God is trying to communicate to his people through this idea of jubilee as we see in the Bible. But if I could boil down today's message to just one statement, I think this is what it would be. To grieve the past so that you can have grace for the future. Are you ready? Well, let's get into it. Okay, okay. I, I, want, I want to ask you, what is one thing that you love to do in your childhood. Come on, just give me, give me one childhood memory that you would love to go back to. Right now, if, you, if, you, if you're following with us, just feel free to throw a comment out there so, so that we can hear from you this morning. But I'll give you an example for me. It was, it was my neighborhood's super soaker wars that we used to have every single summer. You remember those things, super soakers, the, those big squirt guns that were really popular about 20 years ago? We lived for these over the summertime. Every summer, all the kids in the neighborhood would, would get their super soaker gear out, and they would get ready for battle. It was the older kids versus the younger kids. And the younger kids of whom I was a part of, we would kick their butts every time. You better believe it. The older ones might have, have, have a different story than that, but they're wrong, all right? But the best super soaker squirt gun by far was the original. It was the SS-50. These were the best. They had amazing range, and if you took care of them, they would last a long time. Unfortunately, they stopped making super soakers years ago, and so I recently uh, bought uh, what was kind of the new, the new super soakers that, that the Nerf line kind of brings through, and this isn't a commercial for all that, but, but uh, they're a little bit different, so to say, and so, but of course, to feed my need for these magical childhood memories, I had to get a few of these so that I could, uh, I could uh, squirt my kids when they're not looking, you know, that, that's, a, that's a fun time, right? So, so listen, no talking or falling asleep today, or I might have to break out the super soaker during the message just to get you this morning, okay? Right through the screen, I'm going to get you, all right? No, I'm just kidding. But super soakers, their origin dates back to 1982, and that's a great year because that's also the year of my origin as well. But this is when Dr. Lonnie Johnson, a nuclear engineer, initially had the idea of making a high-performance toy water gun. He worked at a place called Jet Propulsion Laboratory as a spacecraft systems engineer for the Galileo mission to Jupiter. That's a pretty cool job, I would think, to have right there. On the side, though, he enjoyed kind of being a part-time inventor. And it wasn't until 1990 that the Super Soaker actually hit the shelves on the store. See, its original name before it was, was the Power Drencher. And I'm kind of glad that they changed it because that name just stinks, right? But, but for Dr. Lonnie, he was actually in his bathroom working on a heat pump that, you, that uh, used water ra- ra- rather than Freon. And he attached it to his bathroom sink and began shooting it into his tub that was several feet away. And he said that the stream of water was so po- powerful that the breeze that was coming off it actually would make the, the curtains of the water, the, the, the shower uh, curtain, actually like start to kind of sway back and forth, and he thought to himself in that moment, this would make a great 
water gun, and it sure did. I know my whole neighborhood crew absolutely loved that these toy water guns were made, and they filled up half of our summers at least. Do you ever wish that you could go back to an experience when you were a kid where you experienced kind of that freedom and that joy, kind of like you had no worries when you were a kid? Do you ever grieve over the fact that you can't really have that anymore, maybe as, a, as an adult? The truth is, is that life changes, and we're supposed to mature, and we're supposed to take on responsibility as we grow up, and we kind of, we kind of buck that in different seasons of our lives. But one of the biggest challenges of our society, and has been for years, is people wanting freedom to make their own choices, but not really wanting responsibility or the consequences that come with those choices. That's kind of the world that we live in. We want everything, but we don't really want to have to do much to get it. We want everything, but it doesn't, you know, we'll try to get it through whatever means, and we don't want to have there to be any consequences in our lives. I mean, that's kind of kind of where we're at. How about the the season that was pre-COVID or before COVID-19? Do you kind of grieve over how we want to be back to what normal looked like before COVID? Before any of all this stuff just, just hit us? Right now, we want 2020 to kind of start over, or we want to hurry it up and and be done with. I don't know about you, but I've had all the crazy I need for this year. Can I get an amen for that? I'm not sure that we can fast forward through the year. I'm definitely sure that we can't really rewind, but I do know this. In order for me to move ahead, I have to move beyond. If I'm constantly looking backwards as to what I can't have anymore or what I should be able to have, I'm not going to see God's vision for the season that we're going into right now. And if I'm unable to really grieve the loss of what I had wished for and move forward, that is where I will stay without moving ahead. I'm going to stay stuck right there, only be living in a daydream and not having a kingdom vision for the life that God has for me. I'm going to stay stuck if all I can do is continue to hope for what was normal before. See, stuckness, at least according to the Bible, is being hyper-focused on the wrong means in order to have the right life. See, everyone wants a right life filled with the right things that God has for us. I think everybody wants that. Everyone wants a good life. No one wants to have to look back and regret most of how they lived their life. No one wants to get to the end of their life and realize that they missed it somehow. If you take a jog through the Old Testament prophets, you'll be able to see this front and center in the lives of God's people in Israel. Time and time again, they got off track pursuing their perceived right lives through the wrong means. Resources, for instance. We need certain resources in order for us to survive. Everybody does. It's not wrong to pursue resources in your life to live. But when we, get, when we go about getting them the wrong way or our supply is solely what we live for, we can get stuck pretty quick. Look what God speaks through the prophet Isaiah to those who were supposedly following him about how they went about getting a resource that all of us need to live, water. It says in Isaiah 22, 11, you made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but you did not look to him who did it or see him who planned it long ago. You see, they tried to dig new reservoirs for water. It's not wrong, it's not bad, but they didn't consider the source. They went after the wrong means and didn't consider the right source. The right source was actually considering what God's direction would have been for them because they were in a difficult season of their life with with fear of, of foreign armies invading, and so they needed the water supply from these pools, from these reservoirs, from these underground streams. And see, they didn't consult God on the how-tos and the direction of life. They were looking to the supply rather than the supplier of the supply will only get you stuck. Check out what Isaiah says about being so focused on peace and protection, yet going about trying to get them in all the wrong ways. Isaiah 31, 1 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and to rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. You see, they wanted peace and protection. Who doesn't? All of us want peace and protection. We all do. We all want security. We all want comfort. We all want freedom. We all want to feel protected. We all want peace. That's good. 
That's what God wants for us. But if we look for any of these through the wrong means, we're setting ourselves up to only be found in a place of stuckness that we'll never be able to get out of because we've refused to actually consult God's ways and then obey them. The best place that you can be is obediently following the commands of God. See, I want protection in my life, but if I have to harm someone else's reputation to feel protected through gossip or slander, I'm stuck in my own methods rather than trusting God in his. See, if I want peace in my life, but if I think I'm going to get peace by how much I've accomplished or how much I have or how much, how liked I am or how good I feel about myself, I'm stuck on me, not on Christ, not in his ways to find the peace that only God can give us. And there's so many people that are looking for peace today. If what you're filling yourself with is costing you your peace in Christ, it's way too expensive. So being focused on getting more money to have nicer stuff, but we're failing to honor God with what he's already given us, stuckness. We're not going to have peace. We're going to have anxiety. Being so focused on the hot topics of today, but not reaching out a hand to actually help somebody else out and love our neighbor, guess what? Stuckness. If you've been going through the Bible in a year with me, uh, with our church family, you, you would have read just pa this past week out of Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2. It says this, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go, to, go late to bed, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. <laughs> What is God saying in there? He gives to his beloved sleep, meaning that he actually gives rest to those who are following him. What's the bread of anxious toil? The bread of anxious toil is constant busyness, trying to make your ways come to fruition. Worried toil, it's useless toil, it's constant toil. It's doing so much activity, but having a small return on that activity in your life to be fulfilled with the things that God wants to give you. In other words, the psalmist is saying, unless God continues to be the center of your efforts, you labor in vain. You live in vain. The things that you're doing are useless, meaningless, because God is not in the center of your life. Your life is stuck in futility. Even the most noble of efforts, such as work, fail if God is not the center. Even the most noble of efforts fail if disobedience is succeeding in our lives. What we allow becomes what we serve. Pastor Josh Finley says this, deceptively small things have the potential to bring incredibly big results. Meaning that small things, when we say yes to the small things that are actually not in God's heart, and we say no to how God wants us to walk through lives, guess what? They can be big results that come from that. They can ruin your relationship with God. So when we allow those small thoughts of anxiety in, or when we allow those thoughts of lust into our minds, and we say, oh, it's just one look, or I can just take a look, or I can just dwell on that thought for a little while, eventually we're going to be serving those thoughts, ultimately ruining our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to be stuck in the midst of it, wondering how we got there. But it's by those little things, those little things that they kind of deceive us and they're, they're more powerful than we give them credit to. So Song of Solomon talks about the little foxes that, that destroy the vine. And we got to be careful of all those little foxes that want to destroy that vine, destroy that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. If we're so focused on having a brighter future, but we can't let it go of our past, guess what? we're going to remain stuck. If we're so focused on what we can't have or what we do not have in this season right now, then we're not going to be ready for what God wants to do next. If I'm trying to look ahead but haven't moved beyond, then complications will be consuming. Changes will be resisted in my heart and my life. Emotions will be exalted over the wisdom of God. I'll start living my life by my emotions and not God's wisdom. Temptations will begin to be surrendered to rather than resisted. The urgent will be traded for what's important. Nobody wants to be stuck in life doing a bunch of things or simply going through the motions. Everyone 
Everyone wants to live for what's truly important. But so often we find ourselves enslaved to a pattern of this life that is more reactive than proactive, what's, what's, what's urgent, not important. We live for what's pressing over what's priority. Say what you want about this COVID-19 season that we're currently still in. I understand. I, I, it doesn't feel normal. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to move on. But I do believe that it has helped a lot of people remember what is important again. Like your spouse, guess what? They're really important. Your children, again, very important. Your health, that's important too. You know, if we're, not, if we're just busy, busy, busy and just letting life consume us, guess what? We're not paying attention to our health. And maybe that's the reason why we're always at the doctors. Maybe that's the reason why we, we need this medication or that medication. What about your neighbors? Guess what? They're important. God says they're important. Actually, the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbors as yourself. That's important. What about your church family? God tends to think that church family is really important. It's where we actually practice our faith and the gifts that God has given us. It's not only there, but also the mission of God on our lives. Like the world, people are important. God has called us on mission if you're following Jesus Christ. It's not just to go to mission to go to church. It's on mission to reach the world and to change the world. What, about, what else is important? How about how, how you spend your time? That's important. How you spend your money, how your faith is in Jesus Christ, that's important. It's not just a belief, but it's how you live your life and how you walk with Jesus. It's not just listening to the word of God. It's walking out the word of God. That's important in our lives. And we all know that these things are important, but sometimes it's really hard to make those things that are important be the actual priorities of which we're living by. There's been somewhat of a greater understanding that life is more precious than maybe we were living it before in this season. We've kind of come to realize just what important is again. Don't get me wrong. There'll be plenty who continue are going to live selfishly and just be focused on self. But I do believe God wants to use this season to help us to live for what is truly important to the God in heaven, Jesus Christ. Jesus is calling us to live a life of what matters the most to God gets the most from me. What if we lived that way? What matters the most to God actually gets the most from me. What matters the most of God receives the most from me, that I give myself to what matters the most to God. So your freedom, that matters to God big time. God wants you to walk and live in freedom in your life in your heart, in your mind, in how you live. God wants that for you. Guess what else matters to God? People matter to God. It's so important. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for this whole world because he loves us so much. And he doesn't want us to live an eternity away from him in punishment, all right? That's God's plan. He gave himself for us because he loves us. People matter to God. Guess what else matters to God? Family matters to God. Your family is so important. And guess what? When our hearts start to go, guess what? The family starts to go. When the family starts to go, communities start to go. When communities start to go, whole nations start to go, right? Your relationship with Jesus, that matters a lot to God. And that's what we're going to be talking about these next several weeks. These things matter so much to God that he actually made a way for the people of Israel to get back to what was important in their lives, knowing that they'd probably get off track somehow. They'd probably get stuck in a rut of a time or two because that's our humanity. So God actually patterned it in. He, 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 he made something for the Jewish people to kind of get themselves back on track, and that was called the year of Jubilee. In the Old Testament law, God declared that the 50th year would be a year of jubilee, a year to restart, if you will, or a year of redemption, a year of rejoicing, a year of release, release from all types of bondages. You see, prisoners that year, they were set free. Slaves were released. Debts were forgiven. Property was given back to their original property owners, and the land and people were supposed to rest and allow God to provide for their lives. 
That's what God, that, that's God's plan. He actually made it. It was a reset. God knew that his people would get off track and live for the wrong things, hoping to have a right life. So he programmed that into their society from the beginning. After the exodus and the law was given to the people of Israel, he programmed that into their culture and society. But the problem was there's no records in the history of the Jewish people that they ever actually followed this law. Maybe it wasn't convenient for them. Maybe it wasn't beneficial to them because they wanted to hold on to what they had or what they worked so hard for. Maybe with their words and with their thoughts and with their entitlements, they wanted to be the people of God, but with their actions and their efforts and their endeavors, they weren't actually following God's ways. They said one thing, but did another. See, God knew that we would get off track in life. And so he actually placed something for his people, his people, to actually, to actually follow so that they could get back on track in their lives. See, time and time again, we see the Israelites, they trusted in chariots and foreign armies for their protection. They trusted in treaties and, and, and man-made solutions for peace. They trusted in their own ingenuity for their own provision. And the question that I have for us is, are we any different? I mean, I, I've had to ask myself as a follower of Christ, where does my protection come from? Does it come from the government? Does it come from my doctor? Does it come from the security of my own home? I've had to ask myself, where does my provision come from? Does it come from God? Or does it come from the economy? From God's hand of provision upon my life or or, or, or the work that I do to, to make ends meet? Where does my peace come from? Does it come from God, or does it come from a good life? Does it come from just fun that I want to have? Does it come from the pleasure that I'm seeking in life? None of those things are necessarily wrong, but if they're more important than Christ, then I've missed it in my life as a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, you know what I've discovered in my own heart, and it's it just simple observation of our humanity, we as people, we want an excuse to live rebelliously. We don't want anyone telling us what we have to do, not even God. So we do all that we can do to kind of justify our rebelliousness. Even as the people of God, even as if you're a Christian, we, we still justify those things that we know clearly God speaks to in his word, and we justify them, claiming the grace of God in our lives, and yet... God's saying, what are you doing? You're being completely rebellious. You want to be in control. You don't, you don't want to allow my ways to work those things out of your life. So the very nature of God is freedom. That's his very nature. He wants freedom for all of us in our lives. But we often equate freedom with control. And they're not the same thing. I think I'm free when I'm in control. But that's not the type of freedom that God gives. We can experience Christ's freedom when we surrender our control. That's how it works, because guess what? In and of myself, I can't live free. I need the freedom of God to be unlocked in my life that I can walk into, because there's too much in this world that enslaves me, namely sin, shame, my past, unforgiveness, the list could go on and on. And that's really, though, listen, this is really what Jubilee is all about. It's about the freedom that God offers us. It's about the, the freedom that Christ provides us. Now, I'm not talking about an Old Testament law for a cultural context. I'm talking about how Jesus actually is our Jubilee. He's the fulfillment of Jubilee. It's in him and only in him that we find Freedom. It's the truth of Christ that will set us free to live in the life of Christ. When Jesus opened up the scroll of Isaiah in his hometown of Nazareth, he opened it to Isaiah chapter 61. This is actually found in Luke chapter 4. He was doing so with intentionality, but he was also doing it sovereignly. I believe that God ordained that moment, the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit set that moment up that in this time when Jesus was going to sit down in his hometown synagogue, 
he would open up to Isaiah chapter 61. It was set up for him to read that day and declare that he was the jubilee that Israel had never, ever taken. Jesus was the jubilee that Israel, Israel walked away from. Israel never accepted. Israel didn't listen to. Israel didn't enjoy. Jesus was the fulfillment of that jubilee. It says in Luke 4, 18 and 19, this is what it says. This is Jesus quoting from Isaiah 61. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Guess what? The year of the Lord's favor is jubilee. It's exactly what he's talking about. You could take the year of the Lord's favor out and replace it with jubilee. That's what it is. It's in Christ that we have the good news of this year of the Lord. It's in Christ that we are made rich. It's in Christ that we are set free. It's in Christ that we can now see before we were blind. Now we can see. It's in Christ that we are now lifted out of our shame. It's in Christ that we have found favor. We have found grace. We have found freedom. And it's only in Jesus Christ that we can find that here on this earth. These next several weeks, we're going to talk about that grace that God gives us to live for what's important to him and how he develops our hearts to begin to desire the freedom that he offers and that we can live for that and enjoy that. We're going to reset, if you will, and rest in that favor that we have in Christ to live these lives of freedom that he's offered us. But we also have to remember the other side of this too. See, when Jesus declared that he was the year of Jubilee in that moment, he stopped short of what Isaiah wrote. And he did that purposefully, by the way. Jesus was sharing how he is the fulfillment of the law for the Israelite people when he opened that up and said, it's me, I'm it, I'm your Messiah. But he's also saying that for the entire world of which the Jewish people didn't quite get. And you see, when Isaiah wrote this hundreds of years earlier, Isaiah was writing this with something else in mind. Certainly he was was writing this as as the Messiah would fulfill the words as God put in his heart to to, to prophesy as well as to write down on the scroll. But as Isaiah was writing of of not only that, he was also writing the hope that the people would have after the, the judgment that they would have to experience because Israel walked away from God. Isaiah goes on to say, in chapter 61, after Jesus kind of ends it, after the favorable year of the Lord, Isaiah says, after God's spirit is, is, is upon him, not only to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, but also the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And he goes on and he talks about what God's going to give to comfort those who are mourning because of the destruction that was coming to the people of Israel. The favor of God would come, but also the comfort of God to those who were going to be mourning in the near future. Now, follow me for a bit because this will all make kind of sense soon. I've got to kind of tie all this together right now. See, Isaiah was a prophet in Judah, and he was warning the people of of that day, the, the people of God, that they were living in essence for themselves and not God. They had they had gone off track quite a ways back. They were wanting the good life, but they were living by the wrong means. They weren't acknowledging God. They weren't looking to him for direction from his word. And they might have known his word, but they weren't walking it out. They were claiming God's blessings, but living by their own efforts. And Isaiah was called to be a prophet of God to warn them that this way of life was not, was not, will not lead them to God's blessing. It actually will lead them to consequences because you've kind of snuffed God out of your life. It will lead to judgment because their hearts were focused on themselves and not what God was calling them to do. You see, if you're a person of God, there's a responsibility placed on your life. And that was so for the Israelite people. They were to be a light to the world and share the grace and the goodness of God to the world around them, and they missed that. You see, this man Isaiah... Interesting guy, he, 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 wrote, he wrote beautiful words and, and God placed in his heart and in his mouth the very words of God and he was very accurate. Actually, Jesus fulfills a number of his prophecies 
as we see in Jesus' life. But many people don't know that Isaiah, he was actually later in his life sawed in half because of the orders of his grandson, Manasseh, who would be king. See, Manasseh was a wicked man. He turned the nation away from God in his life, and so he didn't like the voice of Isaiah preaching the destruction that was going to come and the judgment that was going to come for, from God for, for the people of Israel because they were not following God anymore. Very interesting. See, sometimes when you speak up for truth, you're going to receive a lot of criticism. You're going to receive a lot of persecution. There's a lot of people that have received death in their lives because they've spoken the truth of God. A hundred years later or so, another prophet came along. He spoke about that same judgment that God was going to bring because of the ways of Israel. He, he, he not only spoke of the judgment of the Babylonians coming in and, and decimating their culture as they knew it, but actually he was an eyewitness of it as, as well. This prophet's name was Jeremiah. He is known as the weeping prophet. He wept over Israel's refusal to turn back to God. And then he wept at seeing the actual destruction that the Assyrians came in. The, ar the army of Assyria came in and brought to Jerusalem, how they just annihilated the whole city, the temple, all the people. See, the Old Testament prophets were transmitters of God's warnings and directions to God's people. They were a conscience, so to speak, for the people of God. They would be a constant reminder to God's people of the responsibility that they had to live for God and to share the salvation of God to the world. That was a responsibility placed on their lives. See, a lot of people who, who, who get saved, come to know Jesus Christ and walk with Christ, they don't realize that, that their salvation isn't just for them. It's for others too. Yeah, we get saved from something, but we also get saved for something. We get saved from sin and death an eternal separation from God, but we get saved for freedom, purpose, mission. The mission is to be a light to the world, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to share what Jesus has done in your life to the world around you. But Israel, time and time again, failed to listen to the voice of God. They didn't take serious the life and freedom that God would provide them. They went after their own lives through their own means until one day everything went Wrong. Even though Jeremiah knew it was coming, even though he'd been preaching it for years, it was around 586 B.C. that the powerful Assyrian army stormed the land of Judah and completely decimated it. Everything that was sacred, everything that was normal, everything as they knew it, gone, done. Jeremiah the prophet writes about his grief in the book of Lamentations. And in this book that he writes out, there's five acrostic poems that he writes as he's been a witness to the destruction of Jerusalem. And through this book of lament, the reason that it's named Lamentations, you'll find him protesting to God. You'll find him trying to make sense of all the confusion around him. You'll, try to, you'll find him trying to process all of his emotions at what he's seeing. And listen, we all go through seasons that we're faced with loss, just like Jeremiah. Maybe we don't know that kind of loss, but we all personally have been affected by loss. And to be honest, most seasons actually have loss in them, but we don't realize it because the gain sometimes is more prominent than the loss. Say you just, say you just uh, got a promotion in your job. You lost your old job, but the gain is better because you now have some more money in your pocket or you have more influence or you have this new position. So that gain is more prominent than the loss. See, loss happens, but sometimes we don't acknowledge it until it hurts. Maybe a new child comes along and what an amazing gain in your life. That's beautiful, lovely, wonderful. How precious children are. They're a gift from God. But listen, you also lose plenty to gain that child as well. You lose sleep. You lose money. You lose your time. Sometimes a little bit of sanity, right? I know for us personally, in my household, we've been in diapers, not me, not my wife, but our family have had to buy diapers now for about 11 years. Our youngest is, is, is about to come out of that, right? Two years old, she's, it's, it's going to be a new day. It's going to be a day that we're going to celebrate no diapers in the house because I'm tired of spending my money on diapers. Can I get an amen with, with, with me there, parents? But, but what happens when the loss is greater than the gain? 
How do we respond to that? Well, God's way is found here right through Jeremiah's words. It's called lamenting. Lamenting isn't just crying or weeping or mourning. Lamenting has a purpose. And I think we miss that in our lives because we always want God just to bless us with good stuff and we think that, that God just is up there just to, to bless our lives and, and, and just to, to pour out all this good stuff on us. But biblical lamenting is bringing the pain that you're experiencing with loss to God himself because there's a purpose for it. When my daughter Finley hits her head on the corner of the table and begins to cry, I know why she's crying. She just hurt herself. But when she comes to me right afterwards for comfort and wants me to kiss her head and reassure her that she's going to be okay, guess what happens? Right away, pretty much, she's good to go. Did I say something to her that caused that pain to be gone or did my hug and my kiss on her head make the pain go away? Absolutely not. But my comfort in her pain helped her. She's like, all right, I can keep going now. See, that's what God wants us to do. Lamenting is God's process for when we go through things in life. Lamenting is found or should be found in the believer's lives, but sometimes we we don't realize what it is. And so we kind of think we just got to muscle through everything and persevere through everything. That's part of it, but lamenting has a purpose. It's going to God with our pain, even though he already knows it. Lamenting is bringing our pain and sorrow to him whether or not the circumstance changes. It's interesting because we should be people that lament over sin. We should be the people that lament over suffering, over the shame in this world. We should, we should lament. We should grieve those things. Jesus said, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Seasons of loss and pain reveal where our confidence is built on. Is our faith built on creation or is it built on the creator? If God doesn't have your attention during this crazy season that we're in, I'm I'm not sure what it'll take for him to get it. So many people are dying to get back to normal. But the fruit of normal, if you think about it, actually led us to the season that we're in. Going back to normal might just let us down again anyways. Going back to normal might just be filled with more loss and pain. Going back to normal may not be as wonderful as we dream it was because I guarantee in the normal that was before, you still had plenty of complaints about all the stuff, all the bad, all the negative that was going on. Lamenting isn't questioning God's goodness. It's grieving our losses. True biblical lamenting is pointing yourself to God with the confidence that no matter what we've lost, his goodness and his assurance will help us move beyond. Just like those childhood experiences and memories that we've had when we love to go back to, those feelings of freedom and of joy and not having to work for them, those super soaker wars and fun and and what joy they were, they were great, but They weren't fulfilling in my life. I enjoyed that. And there was a period of my life where I didn't have the responsibility and the worries that I have today in this season. And in order for us to live with our confidence filled with Christ, we have to be able to grieve our losses. If I'm I'm almost 40 years old now and I haven't grieved the fact that that of, of my childhood, guess what? That means I haven't really moved beyond that. We're going to lose good things in life. It's going to happen. Tell God about that pain. His grace is there to comfort you. Yes, there's going to be new losses and new challenges, even in this season to come. Lament those as well. Bring those to God. But do so with knowing that God's ultimate freedom and joy is not found in this life. It's found in the fullness of his presence. And in his, full, in his presence, there is fullness of joy. On this side of heaven, we'll only have glimpses of that. Our confidence is not found in the experiences of this earth. It's found in the assurances of God. So even in the book of Lamentations, where nothing seems to be going right, nothing is normal, nothing seems good, Jeremiah still finds hope in the midst of destruction and craziness. Right in the middle of what he writes, 
all around him, this, this whole book of Lamentations is just a sea of lament. But right smack dab in the middle, Jeremiah gives us hope. He says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Our portion is not found in this world, but it's found in Christ. These words that Jeremiah pens are, are the, the only words of hope in the entire book. Jeremiah acknowledges, even in, in such a great loss, and God's mercy is still there. His steadfast love is still there. His faithfulness will be new every morning. And I don't know about you, but I need a new grace every morning that I wake up to, especially in these times that I find myself living in. I need new grace for a new season. Whether I like the season or not, that's immaterial. The season of what it is, and I need a grace to propel me through the season of what is currently right now. I, I, I might not be able to fix it. I might not be able to control it. So I need God's grace to empower me through it beyond my ability. I need new grace for a new season. And that new grace comes from my jubilee, from Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of jubilee. Because I'm not finding grace to live in anywhere else. Are you? Are you living in a grace right now from any other source other than Jesus? I remember when God first taught me about new grace for a new season. My wife Jenny and I were deeply involved in two teenagers' lives. They were a part of our youth ministry. In this season, they needed extra care because they would not have a place to live with their, in their lives. They were getting evicted. And, and God had spoken to me two years prior to this that we would be presented with taking care of these teenagers one day. And were we going to say yes? Absolutely, we we're going to say yes, because I already know that God told me to do that. But it was a struggle for letting go of a season that felt really normal to us. Because you bring two more into your home, different years, diff different, different family structure, different environment, all that kind of stuff, it's, it's different. It's different. After we brought them into our home, I can remember nights where Jenny and I consumed with the amount of paperwork and care and attention that we had to provide were just, we were just exhausted and struggling, even through the decision of it all. But even in the midst of it, I can remember even in the midst of it that there was a grace. God provided a supernatural grace to continue to walk through what he asked of us to do. See, God will give you supernatural grace when you say yes to him. We weren't perfect throughout it, but God perfected his power even in our weakness. He gave us a new grace for a new season, even as we are grieving the season that we lost before. And if you hear anything at all today, this is what I believe God wants to say. He wants to say, grieve the past so you can have grace for the future. You got to do it. You got to let go of it. You got to cut it out. You got to get rid of it. You got to do it. You got to do it. You got to grieve it. You got to let it go so that you can grab a hold of a new grace. God doesn't want you to be stuck in your grief, but to point your grief to God who can give you the right grace for today and for tomorrow. I don't like to grieve. It doesn't make me happy. I'm sorrowful through it, okay? But I, can I trust God's grip on my life more than I can trust my own control? I believe God is telling some people today, let go so you can grab on. I'll say that again. Let go so that you can grab on. Cut it out so that you can grab a hold of what God wants to do now. That's essentially what Paul learned when he was facing loss and pain and difficulty in his life. God visited him and reassured him in a season of his life with these words. And God said this to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's, that's really what lamenting is. Letting go of our own power so that God's power can rest on us. Letting go of our idea of me and taking a hold of Christ in me. It's funny because power is not supposed to rest, but yet Paul says that God's power will rest upon our weakness. And we allow God's power to rest on us and rest on our weakness rather than exerting ourselves under our own power. God's grace seems to move mightily. There's a lot of lament in this season right now. I'm lamenting a lot as a pastor. I've been for a while. 
I'm lamenting the reality of Western church and what it's become over the many years now. Any fruit that we see today comes from the root that was planted a generation or two ago. This isn't just because it's right now. I'm lamenting that a Christian's political views are equal to or more than their theological views. I'm lamenting that a Christian's witness looks little to no different than those who have no faith at all. I'm lamenting over the priorities of the church, not just organizations, but the people of the church who are called Christians. They're, the priorities are based more on comfort, demands, and their rights rather than God's mission. I'm lamenting over a watered-down theology that looks more like self-help and cor- cor- current cult political correctness. I'm lamenting over the sad state of our nation with Christians who are okay to share all of their opinions, yet are ashamed or fearful to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm lamenting over how people are now viewed as or or live their lives for the approval of others on the newest social media post. I'm lamenting over how the root of all evil, which is the love of money, directs so many Christians' lives rather than the grace of God's provision, protection, and peace. I'm lamenting the indifference and the apathy of the church who they have towards one another, the brokenness of the world around them. We make our decisions so, so often not on what God's view is, but our own, our own views, our own political correctness, our own opinion. Yes, I'm lamenting, just as Jer- Jeremiah lamented at the end of the book, he acknowledged that God is still sovereign and simply asks God not to forget his people. But you know the thing that I love about Jeremiah? He doesn't just use words of hope or have a wish for God's faithfulness. No, he acts on it. He goes and he purchases a piece of land after Jerusalem has been decimated. That's part of the story. Why? Because his confidence was in God, not the circumstances that surrounded him. Jeremiah was in prison when his cousin kind of comes and asks him, hey, I I need some cash right now. Will you buy this land from me? Because you're in prison anyway, so you're not getting out of this. The country was about to be destroyed. I need to get out of here. And Jeremiah says, yes. Why? because it was a statement of his trust in God's future. Do you have a trust in God's future today? God gives us the strength to live in the midst of today, grieving our losses, but stepping out on the grace of God for the future of his kingdom. Jubilee is all about the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. No matter what we face here and now, we can have that freedom he offers us. He's our source and he's our grace to live today for what's important, but God wants us to cut some things out from the last season so that we can grab a hold of what he has for the new season. Let's pray together today. Father, help us to live for what's important, not what is urgent. Help us to live for what is important, not what is popular. Help us to live for what is important, not what is political. Give us the grace of your favor to live with your power resting upon our lives no matter what lies before us. Oh God, please even right now convict us of what we still need to let go of so that we can grab a hold of a new grace for a new season. Please forgive us for being stuck, living for our own supply rather than walking with you. Let us live each day with mercies that are new every single morning. Let us live each day with our daily bread, that manna from heaven that only you supply coming out from the very words of God. Let us live in the fulfillment of Jubilee. Let us live hidden in Christ Jesus. God bless you today. We love you. Pray that this message encourages you. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory.
to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. In the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning and sealed the promise. Your baby. 